and I know the truth. You think I'm gonna let you on Bernie and then come get me? I'm the next king? Why? Because the whole time Bernie was here, you was at- Cat Williams, currently in the spotlight for potentially unveiling Hollywood's influential figures, has once again shed light on how these prominent figures orchestrated efforts to eliminate well-known black icons. Tell the truth. It was Steve's tour. Not it was gonna be called the Kings of Comedy, it was Steve's tour. These are the guys opening for him. Of course you gotta close if it's your door. The passing of Bernie Mac has stirred emotions, bringing attention to the hurdles he encountered throughout his career. His journey was rife with challenges and marked by traumatic experiences. Following his demise, Cat Williams has stepped forward, revealing Bernie's insights into the corrupt practices within the comedy industry. Beyond being a celebrated comedian and actor, Bernie Mac was also a devoted father and husband throughout his lifetime. In the aftermath of his departure, he leaves behind a legacy characterized by a distinctive comedic authenticity, distinguishing him from his contemporaries. He is one of the original stars of HBO's Def Jam. He has a real caring role on the hit sitcom. Bernie Mac's foray into acting saw him landing minor roles in various films, such as 1992's Mo Money and 1995's Friday. However, it was during his brief tenure as the host of the HBO variety show Midnight Mac and his participation alongside comedy heavyweights like Steve Harvey, Cedric the Entertainer, and D.L. Hewley in Spike Lee's The Original Kings of Comedy that Bernie Mac's distinctive comedic style came to the forefront. This pivotal moment established him as not only a proficient performer, but also as a formidable comedian in his own right. Flaming into my inner beauty. Uh, these guys are with me. Uh, this girl is a uh, runaway and following me. Come on. My cousin. The year 2001 marked a significant turning point in Bernie Mac's career. During that remarkable year, Fox debuted The Bernie Mac Show, a series that would go on to receive numerous Emmy and Golden Globe nominations, as well as a prestigious Peabody Award. Simultaneously, Mac took on a prominent role in Steven Soderbergh's renowned film Ocean's Eleven, sharing the screen with Hollywood giants such as George Clooney and Brad Pitt. This dual achievement catapulted him to a new level of recognition and acclaim in both the television and film realms. I don't mean to toot my own horn, America, but Bernie Mac's a genius. He got a to-do list. Following his breakthroughs, Bernie Mac became a fixture in a multitude of high-profile productions. In 2003, he graced the screen in Charlie's Angels Full Throttle and shared the spotlight with Billy Bob Thornton in Bad Santa, while also starring alongside Chris Rock in Head of State. His illustrious career was further punctuated by notable roles in the subsequent Ocean sequels, Transformers, Madagascar, Escape to Africa, and Soul Men. Bernie Mac's consistent presence in these major projects solidified his status as a respected and accomplished actor in the entertainment industry. Well, I understand. There are some great looking fans you got out there. Uh, yes, sir. Top of the line. Yeah. In a tragic turn of events, Bernie Mac's promising career came to an abrupt end in 2008 when he fell victim to pneumonia, further complicated by his enduring struggle with sarcoidosis. Diagnosed with sarcoidosis in 1983, just as his career was gaining momentum, Bernie Mac faced the challenges of this condition, which had also played a role in the passing of Football Hall of Famer Reggie White in 2004. While pneumonia was officially cited as the cause of Bernie Mac's untimely death, it is likely that sarcoidosis played a substantial contributory role in his declining health. Rhonda McCullough, Bernie Mac's widow, holds the belief that her husband's untimely passing could have been preventable. In response to this conviction, she has taken legal action by initiating a wrongful death lawsuit in Chicago, specifically targeting one of Bernie Mac's physicians. According to McCullough's legal claim, Dr. Renee M. Earls, a dermatologist responsible for addressing the skin issues associated with Mac's sarcoidosis, is accused of negligence. The law the lawsuit alleges that Dr. Earls failed to identify signs of medical distress or promptly seek emergency care when Bernie Mac visited his Chicago office on July 17, 2008, a mere three weeks before the comedian's tragic demise. She got up, man, I got up. She got out of bed, I got out of bed, you know. That's where the speculations were started and people believe that Hollywood is directly or indirectly involved in Bernie's death. 
And to prove this, Cat Williama has come to the front seat. Cat Williams has become a prominent whistleblower, exposing hidden realities beneath the glamorous surface of the Hollywood industry. With unwavering determination, Cat continues to disclose revealing truths that are creating shockwaves throughout the entertainment realm. Unfazed by potential backlash and unafraid to address controversial topics that might unsettle some, Cat Williams has candidly confronted issues that seem to have garnered disapproval from certain factions within the industry. Several incidents suggest that Hollywood may be making efforts to distance itself from Cat, likely in response to his resolute and unyielding stance on these matters. Why? Because you know ain't nobody gonna sleep with him. You only got Tiffany Haddish. She been doing comedy since she was 16. Kat's revelation about his former idol may come as a surprise to some, but the subsequent disclosure is even more startling. He claims that Steve Harvey, a beloved figure for many, has allegedly entered into a pact involving his soul with Hollywood. I think Steve Harvey some stand-up ass man. No, I'm a kiss the old girl who owned TV One. He used to kiss her. That's how he had the radio. Certainly, Cat Williams is widely acknowledged as one of the most humorous comics of his generation. Celebrated for his unfiltered wit and dynamic performances in successful stand-up specials. Despite his talent and recognition among Hollywood's comedy elite, Williams has not achieved the same level of mainstream exposure as some of his peers. At times, Williams has expressed a sense of hopelessness, even announcing, I'm just going to go ahead and announce my retirement from stand-up. I'm kind of done. I've already discussed it with my kids. I wasn't really going to do it on a Seattle street. I was going to Los Angeles and do it in the offices of ICM or Live Nation. Persistent rumors have circulated, indicating that Williams had been blacklisted from the industry, raising questions about why he hadn't attained the same level of success as figures like Steve Harvey. It's noteworthy that Williams and Harvey have maintained a strained relationship for over a decade, suggesting a substantial reason behind their ongoing discord. Well, you know, to be honest with you, Frankie, I didn't, I didn't know nothing about this concept. When the promoter told me about it in October, I shot it down. Because that ain't how I've ever promoted a show. You know, I've always been on tour with, with, with some real monsters, man. I've toured yeah. with the Kings. You know, I've been on stage with Sid, DL, and Bernie, man. At the same time. It's always been a camaraderie. Right. You know what I mean? We're going out here to give the people the best show we can give them. And that's the way we've always promoted comedy shows. Now, you know, to turn this into some type of little beef, that ain't got nothing to do with me. That ain't how I do. Now, you know, I done heard all of the YouTubes and I done heard all the interviews and all like that. But that ain't got nothing to do with me. You know, you want to sell a ticket like that, knock yourself out. You sold out concerts. You both have had huge gate receipts. You, you sold out concerts in this town for years. Hello. And it ain't finna be no different tonight. And I ain't never sold them out saying I was better than this one or that one. I just come in here on my own strip. And so tonight at the joke, I'm going to do what I've been doing for 20 years. According to Cat Williams, Steve Harvey's public image may not be universally positive. Depending on who you ask, Harvey is either hailed as one of the funniest individuals globally or perceived as a celebrity with a less than stellar reputation. Williams contends that Harvey has undisclosed aspects in his past, including rumors of mistreatment towards his staff. Speculations have circulated regarding the renowned comedian and talk show host not treating his staff well. Moreover, after relocating his talk show to Los Angeles, Harvey allegedly issued a controversial memo to his new staff, outlining demands typically associated with tour writers. These allegations have contributed to the ongoing tension between the two comedians. And I could not find a way to walk from the stage to my dressing room, to sit in my makeup chair, to walk from my dressing room to the stage. Certainly, Cat, renowned for his fearless approach, openly revealed that he was privy to the genuine story of Bernie Mac. He did not hesitate to expose what he claimed to be the closely guarded secret within the entertainment industry regarding this matter. He said, I know that the people that made money off Bernie Mac didn't like him. They hated his guts. Not only is Cat speculative about Bernie's death, but also about Prince's death. Prince's insights into Hollywood took on a more ominous tone when he tragically passed away in an elevator. The circumstances surrounding Prince's death inside an elevator were particularly eerie, according to L.A. Reid, especially given Prince's known apprehensions about elevators. As depicted in the following video from E.T., Prince's friend Reid discussed the unsettling discovery of Prince's lifeless body in an elevator. One time when I was with him privately, he said, you know what the elevator is, right? No. I said, no, what's the elevator? He said, well, the elevator is the devil. 
According to ET, Reed shared Prince's aversion to elevators. Prince held a belief that elevators were sinister in nature, often referring to them as instruments of the devil. This perspective on elevators was encapsulated in Prince's 1984 song, Let's Go Crazy. In the song's lyrics, Prince likened elevators to malevolent forces that might attempt to bring a person down. He sang about the struggle to ascend by pressing a higher floor button, symbolizing his defiance against the negative influence he associated with elevators. He sings, and if the elevator tries to bring you down, go crazy, punch a higher floor, if you don't like the world you're living in. Take a look around you, at least you got friends. You see I called my old lady, for a friendly word. She picked up the phone, dropped it on the floor, ah uh, ah uh, is all I heard. Are we gonna let the elevator bring us down? Oh no, let's go! Reed recounted a conversation he had with Prince regarding the artist's feelings about elevators. This discussion left Reed feeling uncomfortable as it delved into the topic of the devil, something he was uneasy discussing. The news of Prince's lifeless discovery in an elevator on the first floor of Paisley Park, Prince's residence and studio, deeply perturbed Reed, given the context of their previous conversation. One time when I was with him privately, he said, you know what the elevator is, right? I said, no, what's the elevator? He said, well, the elevator is the devil. It scared me. I don't like to talk like that, but he said that. So for me, it was like really haunting when I read that he was found in an elevator, which was what triggered the public because they think it might connect to him being outspoken against the industry. Prince undeniably stands as one of the most influential musicians in history, with a remarkable career that extended across more than four decades. His legendary status within the music industry is underscored by the extraordinary achievement of selling over 100 million records worldwide, a distinction attained by only a select few. Prince's global influence is immeasurable, and although he is primarily celebrated for his music, he also made forays into the realm of film. It's in blue. Prince's versatility as an artist extended beyond his music and encompassed his image, where he attained the status of a S symbol by embracing an androgynous challenging traditional gender norms, and breaking free from racial stereotypes. His bands frequently included talented female members, and he consistently championed women within the music industry throughout his illustrious career. However, his dedication to women's empowerment also generated a range of rumors and speculations, ultimately contributing to his growing disillusionment with the industry. Don't, don't be fooled by the internet. Uh. It's, it's cool, it's cool to get on. In the music industry, Prince, who sadly passed away at the age of 57, emerged as a trailblazer and, at times, a contentious champion of artist rights. Throughout the 1990s, he engaged in open conflicts with the music industry, resorting to protests such as etching the word slave onto his cheek and adopting an unpronounceable glyph as his name. These bold actions were his means of expressing profound dissatisfaction with the major label system. He said, record contracts are just like, I'm going to say the word, slavery. I would tell any young artist, don't sign. Furthermore, in a 1996 interview with the Los Angeles Times, Prince conveyed such a deep distaste for the music industry that he disclosed a longing to have pursued an entirely different career. He exclaimed, If I knew the things I know now before, I wouldn't be in the music industry. If Prince were an emerging artist in 2022, he would likely have thrived in the contemporary music landscape. Today's artists enjoy more autonomy and are not as reliant on major labels to manage their careers. Prince, with his musical ingenuity and entrepreneurial mindset, proved that artists could be both creative powerhouses and astute entrepreneurs, challenging the traditional belief that such decisions should be exclusively dictated by corporate executives. There's a war going on, the battlefields in the mind, and the prize is the soul. When contemplating Prince, our minds conjure the image of a versatile genius, adept at composing, producing, mastering various musical instruments, and possessing dance skills that rivaled even his backing performers. Elevating Prince to the forefront of our consciousness, we unmistakably associate him with sensuality, evident through his overtly provocative style. His music becomes synonymous with intimate, bedroom-friendly melodies, and we perceive the man, in his own renowned words, as an individual individual of immense allure and magnetism. Uh, mainly I sensed a great deal of uh, negativity and entropy in the music. There's, um, 
There's a disintegration going on. However, in the midst of the undeniable S undertones prevalent in Prince's music, and even within his persona, we also discover another facet that has historically clashed with S religion. Indeed, the complex interplay between S and religion has been a source of tension with the Catholic Church, for instance, long considering the topic a taboo. Yes, not that. No. I'm talking about very spiritual in nature. And that's a God-given gift, too. Moreover, he has also predicted his own death on several events, which suggests that he was aware he might be K because he was rising in his career very fastly. One of his fans wrote, The industry has been killing off artists for a long time now. MJ, Prince, Whitney, etc. When you no longer want to play by their rules, this is your end, or they will destroy you in front of millions. This industry is very evil. Another fan wrote, It's heartbreaking to think of such an icon being in a position of helplessness, knowing they were coming for him, and everyone around him was wicked. Soon as he got ownership BCK from his music, they <laughs> him. One other fan penned his emotions as before he died. I watched him in an interview where he said that G. Washington was not the first U.S. president, that there was eight other presidents before him, and like he said, I don't know about you, but I get a bit pissed off when people lie to me. Yeah, I get pissed too. Next icon who is supposed to be eliminated by Hollywood elites is none other than Whitney Houston. On July 18, 1992, Whitney and Bobby exchanged vows at her home in front of a star-studded guest list of 800 people, as reported by Lifetime. While the beginning of any union is typically seen as one of the purest stages of a lifelong commitment, the alleged DA that haunted the couple in the years following their wedding had already taken root on the day of their nuptials. According to Brown's account of the significant day, he witnessed Whitney snorting C before the ceremony, and she purportedly offered him some as well. Brown claims to have declined, as detailed in his autobiography, Every Little Step, My Story. However, this incident marked only the initial encounter with Dee for the couple. Despite the challenges, they managed to sustain successful careers and celebrated the birth of their only child together, Bobby Christina, in 1993. It's not a mystery to me. The same thing that happened to my daughter is what happened to Whitney. There's only one person that was around both occasions. Both admitted to using D and consuming A, but this aspect of their lives remained concealed and only came to light years later. In the 2000s, when Whitney started making headlines, many speculated that it was likely Brown's influence that led to her struggles, given their vastly different media perceptions. However, it was revealed that Houston's substance use had begun years before she met Brown, a fact confirmed by her brother after her death. During their marriage, both Whitney and Bobby found themselves entangled with D-related incidents. The first notable headline emerged when Houston was discovered in possession of M in Hawaii in 2001. Subsequently, numerous stories about the singer's legal troubles shed light on a habit she had managed to keep hidden for years. Brown, too, had his share of encounters with the law, facing arrests for depossession and reckoning with legal issues from his past in 2003, as reported by CNN. That year proved to be eventful for the couple, with Dee dominating much of the news surrounding them and a domestic violence incident further exacerbating their troubles. Despite Brown being charged with battery for a Houston, the couple remained together, and it became increasingly evident that their relationship was toxic. Fulton County authorities here in the Atlanta area have filed a domestic violence battery charge against R&B singer Bobby Brown. The pressures of fame took a toll on Houston. In 2002, a year after being caught with Dee, she made a notable appearance on the interview show Primetime with Diane Sawyer. The infamous interview featured a stunning admission where Houston discussed her Dee use and coined the memorable phrase crack is whack. By 2004, her D use had escalated, leading her to voluntarily admit herself to rehab for a few days, as reported by Entertainment Weekly. A year later, she returned to rehab for a second time. The pills. It has been, at times. However, it was proved that it was not her husband who ruined her, but some other people were involved in her downfall. Regarding this, many reports suggest that Diddy and Clive Davis have some connection with her death. The speculations got further confirmed when Clive himself admitted that he was the only one who was with her in her last moments. Davis played a pivotal role in giving Puffy his initial opportunity to establish Bad Boy Records, but his greatest success came when he discovered Whitney Houston. By spending time with her when the picture was inescapable. There were two times, one live where she came to my home where we had a personal 
However, as Whitney Houston navigated the complexities of the music industry, she, like many others, began to observe peculiar and unsettling occurrences. In her 2002 interview with Diane Sawyer, she candidly addressed the challenges she faced and the demons she battled, shedding light on the darker aspects of the industry. Whitney at times looked uneasy, uncomfortable, and at many times cautious within every word she spoke and even spoke that she herself was possessed with an inner devil whom was controlling her. It was rough. It was rough. I think I kind of reverted back as I got older and said, well, I'm just going to party, you know? It was kind of a rebel in me. She brought up her dispute with Clive Davis and a potential conspiracy to harm her in the course of that interview. In divulging numerous industry secrets, she unwittingly made herself a target. Exploiting her vulnerabilities and past struggles with addiction, they aimed to undermine her credibility and ensure that the public didn't take her revelations seriously. The unexpected and shocking news of her demise occurred at a time when no one anticipated such a tragedy, especially given the circumstances surrounding it. It was a sorrowful twist of fate that profoundly impacted the music world. Tragically, the entertainment industry has witnessed numerous instances where artists, immersed in the demanding nature of their work, succumb to the scourge of DA. Whitney Houston was no exception. And if Whitney could witness such death, then why not Michael Jackson? Jackson's career was a testament to his musical genius. However, the trajectory of his life took a tumultuous turn as his personal struggles, characterized by eccentric behavior, reported addiction, and child A allegations, began to overshadow his artistic achievements in his later years. Despite his continuous presence in tabloid headlines, Jackson chose to withdraw from public performances entirely during the last decade of his life. Totally false. Before I would hurt a child, I would slip my wrist. I would never hurt a child. It is totally false. I was outraged. Despite a tumultuous life frequently unfolding in the public eye, the abrupt passing of Michael Jackson on June 25, 2009, elicited genuine shock. After decades marked by more unsettling tabloid headlines than chart-topping hits, it appeared that the entertainer was poised to redirect his focus to his career. He had committed to a 50-night residency at London's esteemed O2 Arena for a comeback show titled This Is It, promising an extravagant retrospective of his illustrious illustrious career. Chase, who had been hired by Jackson in March, experienced a unique journey with the pop star. Initially let go in May, she returned to Jackson's service on June 2nd. During her tenure, she noted that Jackson's primary focus was on maintaining a diet centered around fresh and healthy food, not only for himself, but also for the children under his care. She said she prepared meals for the family and occasionally for Murray. She said Jackson was in training for his upcoming shows in London and told her, you have to take care of me. According to Kai Chase, on typical days, Dr. Conrad Murray would bring Michael Jackson the specially prepared fruit juice drinks she crafted, accompanied by granola with almond milk. The pop star's lunch, shared with the children, featured a menu ranging from items like spinach salad to chicken. Sometimes, Dr. Murray would join them for dinner, which might include dishes such as seared ahi tuna. Chase mentioned that the doctor would consult with her regarding the 50-year-old singer's dietary preferences, ensuring that he ate properly. Mr. Jackson's juices are some sort of breakfast for him for that morning. So around that time, I noticed I hadn't seen Dr. Murray. Despite the routine, the only peculiar aspect was the presence of oxygen tanks. Chase admitted to never inquiring about the purpose of the oxygen and emphasized that she noticed no indications of Jackson being on D or experiencing declining health. Normally in the morning, he would bring oxygen tanks from upstairs downstairs, one in each hand, she said. Authorities conducted searches at Dr. Conrad Murray's Las Vegas home and medical office as part of an investigation, which also involved raids of his clinic and storage in Houston. So so was that doctor hired by the Hollywood elites to end his career? Craig Mack's incident also raised the eyebrows of many people. I'm told Craig Mack, if he didn't change management, he wouldn't <laughs> with him no more. You understand? And they had a real big beef behind that. That was Gene Deal, who during an interview openly disclosed that Sean Combs, commonly known as Puff, was on the brink of a significant conflict with Craig Mack due to management-related issues. Craig also said, And I go in the studio and I start banging out. So he came to me and was like, yo, I can only cut you a third of the money I'm supposed to give you. 
passive. This was the primary cause of the dispute between Craig and Diddy. Allegedly, not only did Diddy fail to compensate him fairly, but he also issued threats against him. No cash, no record. I'm not going to be sitting here going in the studio all night, every night, busting my ass, and I ain't seeing nothing from it. Now, there are speculations that Craig's outspokenness about his rights might have been the underlying reason for his untimely demise. This revelation has cast a significant shadow over Diddy. Nevertheless, he has consistently presented the following explanation. The first of all is, is there has been negative propaganda put out about me that's not true. So, what became of our distinctively faced TWA toting favorite? Well, he didn't end up banished to the bad boy basement like some other long forgotten acts, or serving time for murder like G Depp, or recovering from a stress induced stroke after a grand larceny conviction like Black Rob. No, Craig Mack took another well trodden path out of bad boy religion. You see, if you go back far enough with Craig, as one man called this morning, he said, I knew Craig, he said I was one of his fans. But what actually made him join a cult religion? Craig Mack was indeed one of the first artists to release music under Bad Boy Records. Initially, his career showed promise, but it eventually faced challenges. Some skeptics argue that his career was destined for difficulties right from the start. The emergence of the notorious Big in Diddy's stable is often mentioned as a significant turning point, although the exact reasons for Craig Mack's career decline remain a subject of speculation. There is no credible evidence to support claims of an attempted attack on Craig Max life related to his career struggles. I'm not going to be sitting here going in the studio all night, every night busting my ass, and I ain't seeing nothing from it. Craig Mack faced ongoing challenges related to his physical appearance, enduring hurtful comments and jokes within the hip-hop community. These insults, which targeted his looks, had taken a toll on his well-being. Even individuals from his own racial background were joining in on the criticism. Interestingly, some of this animosity can be attributed to his perceived role in hindering Biggie's career. It's worth noting that Diddy, who seemed to harbor negative feelings toward Craig, didn't step in to support him during this difficult period. Puff didn't like him for whatever reason he did he told Craig, yo, if you don't fire your manager, you can't work for bad boy. Mac's reluctance to fully embrace Diddy's vision for a commercially successful rap career played a significant role in their discord. Mac disapproved of Diddy's involvement in what he saw as morally questionable events, such as extravagant parties, excessive drinking, and attempts to exert control over the artist. Ultimately, Mac's downfall can be linked to his decision to resist Diddy's influence and direction. Feeling lost and in a difficult situation, Mac made the decision to part ways with Bad Boy Records. During this period, he expressed concerns that there were individuals actively plotting against him, adding to the challenges he faced. He said, I caught a couple of threats, you know, a couple of passes by in the streets. Following his departure from the music industry, Craig Mack largely disappeared from the public eye, with few television appearances. Over time, it became known that he had devoted himself to his faith and was actively practicing his religion. What is your name, sir? My name is Craig Mack. And uh, uh, what did you used to do when you was in the world? Wickedness. Wickedness. Oh, okay. <laughs> and what are you doing now? Righteous. Amidst receiving death threats, speculation arose that these threats played a pivotal role in Craig Mack's departure from Bad Boy Records and his subsequent embrace of an undisclosed religious path. Following this unsettling period, Mack withdrew from the public eye, refraining from television appearances. However, he re-emerged through a video released by the Overcomer Ministry, a secretive Christian group located in South Carolina, which has garnered controversy and been labeled a cult by former members. This reappearance added an element of intrigue to Mack life and his connection with this controversial organization. These cool black icons who've been a big inspiration for lots of young artists and fans seem like they might have been kind of disappointed by those Hollywood big shots. Not sure if this whole thing is going to get better or not. Gotta wait and see how it plays out over time. That's it for today. See you in the next video. Until then, goodbye.